welcome to Public Service Futures, the left alternative to the crony state. My name's Kate Murray. I'm the editorial director of the Fabian Society, and I'll be chairing this session. Um, we've got a fantastic program over the whole weekend, but I'm particularly excited for this session where we have a really good lineup to discuss an issue which sadly far too often has been dominating the headlines over the past few weeks and months. Um, we've seen during the coronavirus crisis public servants demonstrating extraordinary resilience and effort, but we've also seen huge capacity problems following years of austerity and outsourcing. Um, and the Conservatives have repeatedly responded to the crisis with centralised, inflexible outsource solutions and worse. Um, we've, we've had contracts for PPE for health and care staff given to companies with no experience, no assets virtually in some cases, but the right connections. Um, we've seen a VIP lane for procurement, track and trace callers, no calls to make, meals contractors sending out a couple of potatoes and half a manky pepper um, as a supposed substitute for their school lunches. The list goes on. So this session will look at what's gone wrong and how Labour can put up an alternative to put it right. Um, just to mention, there's a deliberate nod in our session's title to a publication that FEPS and the Fabian Society published just as the coronavirus crisis started, um, Public Service Futures, um, that explored centre-left solutions to the challenges facing public services in the UK and across Europe. Much of the report's analysis, even though it came out just as, you know, the crisis um, was was starting, um, about the, some, the analysis about the failings of our centralised, marketised state are even more relevant in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so without further ado, I'll um, uh, let you know what we're going to do. We're going to have uh, seven minutes from each of our wonderful panel, um, and then that should give us plenty of time for questions. If you could put your Q&As into the, the question box, um, and we'll take them at the end. Just a reminder that the session is on the record, and there might be journalists in the room for everyone. Um, our first speaker is Rachel Reeves, MP. Rachel has been the Labour MP for Leeds West since 2010. Her shadow cabinet roles have included shadow chief secretary to the Treasury and shadow secretary of state for work and pensions. And she's currently shadow chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and shadow minister for the cabinet office. Um, she's also a great friend of the Fabian Society and in 2019, edited a collection of essays for us entitled Everyday Socialism. Over to you, Rachel. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kate, and it's um, great to be uh, here with all of you, um, even if just virtually um, today. Um, my, my, my role in the Shadow Cabinet now, although it's a very long title, basically means that I shadow um, Michael Gove, so um, on issues around Brexit, but also during the COVID pandemic in particular, around um, the, the cronyism that we're speaking about today and the government's propensity to, to outsource at every opportunity rather than to run services at a local level and in-house. And, and I'm really pleased to be speaking in today's um, uh, session because I think that this, this debate and this argument is really important for, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it is a real weak spot for the government. And if we can prosecute properly this argument that the Conservatives are more interested in private greed than the common good, in rewarding their friends and donors on contact rather than delivering the excellent public services that we need now more than ever, that's really important for us in winning the next election. But there's also another point that's really important, which is that the public, sadly, although they recognise some of the faults of the Tories, I think they're actually quite good at governing. Now, we may want to disagree with that vehemently, but we need to win that argument. And I think in this area of, of the obsession that, that Kate has spoken about in the introduction around outsourcing is a really important way to do that. So I want to touch on three themes today. First of all, around that issue about private gain rather than the common good. Second, around cronyism and the democracy which seems to be 
the uh, vehicle for winning contracts from this government. But thirdly, and this is probably something that Roxana will want to touch on as well, the, the lack of respect um, for public services and local knowledge, which seems to be endemic in every government department uh, and, 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 and links to this issue of, of outsourcing. In Keir's acceptance speech when he became leader of the party, he spoke about those workers who are underappreciated and undervalued. And during the first lockdown, we came out on Thursday evenings to clap for them. They're not all in the public sector, but very, very many of them are. They include um, the, the hospital porters and nurses, teachers, teaching assistants, uh, cooks and cleaners, um, refuse collectors, job centre staff. And what links many of them is that their jobs are all in public service, but in many cases, they are not now counted as public servants because they are employed by the private sector to deliver essential public services. And with that change in their status has come a weakening in terms of conditions and often pay. Uh, the, uh, the central motive of the firm and the way in which their reward is now around profit rather than delivering excellent public services. And those services become unaccountable because they're not delivered by the state, either locally or centrally. In the last parliament, I chaired the Select Committee for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And the, 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 the most important thing I felt during the three years that I chaired that committee was the inquiry that I chaired into the collapse of Carillion. And for me, much of what I'm doing now in the shadow cabinet is unfinished business, really, because I felt during that inquiry that this obsession with outsourcing and turning to private firms to deliver essential public services had just gone too far, and that the people who suffered were the taxpayers, they were people who relied on public services that in many cases were never delivered, and there's hospitals in Sandwell and Merseyside that have never been completed, and God, we need them today but also small businesses who are subcontracted by Carillion and by workers who work for Carillion who now find that their pensions are worth just a fraction of what they are before. And this pandemic has been a further gold rush, I'm afraid, for outsourcing firms who spot an opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to make a quick um, buck. And we saw from Rupert Soames, the, um, the, the, the chief executive of Serco um, last year, really this summed up in an email that he sent that was then subsequently uh, leaked. And, and that email uh, uh, said that this pandemic was an opportunity to cement the position of outsourcing firms, including his own, in public uh, services. So those outsourcing firms, uh, uh, like Carillion, um, um, as was, like Serco, like G4S, like CITL, like many, many others, see this pandemic not as an opportunity to meet public need and serve the common good, but instead as an opportunity for them to expand their reach into our essential public services. And what is the problem of all of this? And I, and I think it is worth setting it out. The key problem is that it's just not working. It's not working when it comes to the delivery of PPE for our frontline workers. It's not working in terms of the testing centres that were set up. It's not working in terms of the uh, tracing system that is supposed to be um, protecting us and not helped by the fact that the government do not support properly people who are sick and need to self-isolate, but also because so much of these essential public services are being run for profit by people and by companies who are not integrated in the fabric of our communities. And let me just give you a few examples in the in, um, of ways in which this is not working and the way in which it is wasting taxpayers' money uh, and, and, and because of this crony connection. Aenda Capital, a private equity firm, were awarded a contract to deliver face masks during the um, the, 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 the height of the pandemic, at least in the, in the first uh, wave. The 50 million of those face masks were unusable at a cost to taxpayers of £150 million. Randox pay £100,000 a year to the Tory MP and former minister, Owen Paterson, on top of his salary as an MP. Uh, and that company got the contract to make testing kits. 
750,000 of those had to be returned because they were not safe for use. Mellor Designs, run by the former Tory cabinet minister, David Mellor, his company were awarded 90 million pounds to make masks and produce sanitizers. They got their contract like so many others on this VIP fast track system, not because that they were the best firm to deliver the contract, but because they had the closest links to Tory ministers. All the meanwhile, public services are under-resourced to deal with the pandemic and British UK, British textile and manufacturing firms who are desperate to support in this pandemic and who have skills and expertise are being overlooked because they don't have those links to Tory ministers and Tory MPs. Let me just finally say something about um, transparency. It's 20 years ago, last November, um, the, the previous Labour government under Tony Blair introduced freedom of information. But freedom of information and accountability are essential for good governments, uh, governance and for a healthy um, democracy. And I, I think that um, freedom of information needs to be updated for the 21st century. And the Tories hide now behind uh, commercial confidentiality and not giving out information about um, contracts. That's not right, because it means that these services are utterly unaccountable to the people who depend on them. So a future Labour government, I believe, will need to insource more services, but also crucially deliver services at a local level where we understand the communities in which they operate. Because the types of testing centres, uh, the types of contact tracing that are needed in Newham versus Leeds or in Bridgend versus Blackpool are very different based on the local needs of people and the demographics of those communities. The Tories have never bothered to understand or care to understand these differences and these local needs. And I've seen this pandemic too often as an opportunity to reward their friends and donors and to take more uh, powers and resources away from essential public services who I think um, at every turn, whether it's in the NHS, our local councils or in our schools have been the heroes of this crisis. Whilst Ienda, Serco, Randox, Mellor Designs and others, I think have been the, um, the villains uh, assisted by their friends in government. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, that was excellent, if shocking, with some of those examples of, of waste and, and cronyism that we've seen over the last few months. Um, we'll move on to um, David Walker now. Um, David was a director of the Audit Commission and editor of Guardian Public. His most recent book, co-authored with Polly Toynbee, is The Lost Decade, 2010 to 2020 and what lies ahead for Britain. Um, he's written widely on public spending and in fact, we're delighted that David and John Tizard are working on a, a forthcoming pamphlet for the Fabian Society, making the case for a radical overhaul of how we account for spending. Um, over to you, David, thank you. David, can you unmute? Can't hear you. Should be on your top left. Yeah, I was pressing it, but it's now. <laughs> <laughs> apologies, apologies. I was saying, great privilege to follow uh, follow Rachel and to precede uh, 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 Roxana and uh, and Andy. Um, now, um, I'm going to offer you two uh, positives and one uh, negative as we think about the uh, Labour Party and the future of public services. Clearly, as Rachel has emphasised, there has to be a boost for uh, us. Um, from COVID. Process has broken down, uh, Rachel described examples, public money has been wasted, ineffectiveness in public service delivery abounds. Labour traditionally is associated with public services, so surely there is some harvest of goodwill there. You might well ask how anyone who cares about schools, 
health, social care, uh, ever vote Tory again. If you were to parse the statements by, for example, chief constables over the past uh, nine, ten months, that traditional association between law and order and the Tory party clearly uh, doesn't work anymore. The, the police uh, just do not find uh, law and order Tory Home Secretary's impressive leaders of their service. So again, surely opportunity there. But um, the public can be fickle, public attitudes towards um, the health service we've seen recently, not necessarily predictable. Uh, people's worries about vaccines indicate a degree of suspicion uh, on the part of some members of the public about aspects of public service. And a big background question for us will always be, are the public prepared to pay for decent levels of public provision? Leave that one hanging. And also something that I'm sure Rachel has been devoting attention to and will continue to is that have we witnessed some deficit in the basic capacity of our central civil service? Leave aside the uh, incompetence of ministers. We take that in a sense for red. But if you look at the tenure of Mark Sedwell as cabinet secretary, he wasn't actually... Uh, you know, I'm not in no way associating us with the, uh, the way he was got rid of by Boris Johnson, but was he exactly the man for the job? And the, the, one of the problems as we go forward will be to extract from the hypocritical criticism of the civil service we've heard from Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings elements that are actually opposite, that there are failings in capacity, a lot of it to do with the hollowing out that occurred during the years of austerity after 2010, no question. But a Labour government would inherit a machine that wasn't altogether fit for purpose, and we would have to accept it might take a considerable period uh, to sort that out. However, another positive, the cronyism that's been exhibited, described by Rachel, surely is a political opportunity. Uh, Peter Hennessy, great friend uh, uh, of mine, uh, coined the phrase genetic endowment of the British state. And that genetic endowment really has a long association with anti-corruption. If we can continue to put in front of the public these examples of what basically corruption on a scale that reminds you of the 18th century, reminds you of the need that in the 19th century led to the creation of a disinterested, neutral civil service, that we are back again with the need to reaffirm um, those aspects of British public service, which are associated with that attempt to move away from the pecuniary and private interests of ministers into a, a, a public interest uh, space. So Labour could become, a, as it always has hoped to be, the party of probity, the party of efficiency, as well, of course, as uh, equality and sustainability in public services. But let's face it, the politics of responsibility, the politics of efficiency, um, um, John and I, John Tis and I, are hoping to explore this. Don't always stir the blood. Uh, and a great lesson from the period 1997 to 2010 is surely that public expenditure, extra public expenditure, necessary public expenditure alone, uh, won't necessarily be enough. And um, public service delivery has, in a sense, to win hearts and minds. There is an affective dimension to the way public services are received by people participate uh, in and. In that we're in an era when the politics of identity are strong, I think a considerable amount of thought has to be given to how we might put our public service offer under rubrics which have to do with people's sense of who they are. And I'll just say briefly a bit about that in terms of the local central space in a minute. But again, Labour surely starts with a huge advantage. Um, as the party of public services, able, unlike the Conservatives, to have a, a genuine dialogue with those representing the staff in public services. Uh, the recent election uh, in unison is, is an augury of the richness of that, that conversation. Um, and surely, as, as Rachel sort of given us the example, proper accounting for public services must involve a critique of the kind of contracting out that we've seen. That phrase, take back control, applied to public services must mean the kind of eloquent criticism of profligacy in contracting out that Rachel's described, without, however, being dogmatic, because there will be many Labour council leaders, there will be many uh, la Labour people in government in Wales who will think, yes, we do need a new accounting for contracting, but that won't necessarily mean in every public service an end to a relationship with 
private or non-profit uh, suppliers of services. But here briefly is my, my negative or my, my area of caution. One sometimes hears uh, on the centre uh, left um, a kind of rush to move away. Centre doesn't work, Tories are in power, let's go for the local. And a besetting sin I fear is that people forget a large chunk of local government in England is and may always remain in Conservative hands and giving over power ad hoc to local government runs the risk that, as we've seen with children's services, as we saw with Sure Start, Tory councils will use the opportunity of freedoms to move away from the kind of social state that we uh, we prize. Not all, I have to say, not all councils are like Newham, not all councils are like Camden, where I live, not all councils um, are like those in Greater Manchester, not all civic leaders. Uh, are like uh, Andy Burnham. We mustn't forget that large swathe of Tory England that runs from Lincolnshire uh, to Cornwall. And also, not all Labour local authorities are as excellent as um, some of them. So leaving services up to locality isn't, in my view, um, a permanent solution. Of course, there are background questions to be explored about local taxation and revenue raising. And let's face it, too, that there are ways in which even if there is excellent labour controlled local service provision, it doesn't necessarily redound to the party's general advantage. And look at what happened in Wigan, a good local authority, labour controlled in 2019 in terms of the parliamentary constituencies. Um, Sally Jimson's just written an excellent uh, piece for the Fabian Society describing what's going on, what has been going on in Bassett Law, where again, a labour local authority did great things. It didn't have much positive effect in terms of the perceptions of uh, Labour in terms of parliamentary election. I'll just briefly, if I may, quote a couple of points from um, Deborah Madison's uh, excellent recent book about uh, Red Wall England. She said most of the reactions to local councils that I heard were uniformly negative. Um, people felt they weren't distributing funds fairly. People They allowed people to play the system. They overhelped migrants, they overhelped drug users rather than them, the Red Wall people uh, and their families. Um, and we have to be aware, do we not, that there, is, um, there isn't necessarily any, any greater affection in principle for locally delivered services from services nationally. Let me conclude with this, I hope, more upbeat uh, sense. Um, the Labour Party traditionally has stood for, and I think will always have to stand for, standards. Standards that apply willy-nilly from Berwick in the north to Bridport uh, in the south for equal access to excellent public services, for services that make civilised life possible, for levelling up, yes, rural, urban, far-flung, near, uh, ground down, those uh, in the middle. There is, if you like, and I think it's valid in the 21st century, an Atlean, a Wilsonian vision of countrywide standards in service provision. It doesn't preclude local action, doesn't preclude maximum autonomy for local council leaders to respond to the need of their local areas, but rests upon a platform that does exist or should exist uh, England wide. Um, you look at the work, uh, well, and the food, uh, food uh, poverty, uh, school, food, school. People want to have the same standards throughout the country. And I think there is language there. David Edgerton spoke about this, which is available to Labour, which isn't available to the Conservatives. But it would mean our compromising, perhaps, on the idea that everything, can be handed over to locality and that somehow ipso facto would make things better. So I'm ending by saying yes to more local dynamism and discretion and let's extol far better than we do the excellent work that some, many local labour local labour control local authorities do, but think of that within a framework and an envelope of, of all England yes, all England standards, backed up, this is the work that John Tizard and I are doing, by a new scheme of performance assessment for, for comparison, uh, audit uh, and accountability, which would try and ensure that wherever people lived in England, they would have, thanks to Labour, uh, access to the same high level of public services. Thanks very much, David. And I think that's a, a great challenge, the battle to 
win hearts and minds for um, the public spending offer that, that uh, Labour wants to make. Um, so we'll move on to Roxana Fias now. Um, delighted to have you here. Roxana was elected Mayor of Newham in 2018, becoming London's first directly elected female mayor. And I think Roxana, the um, first woman of colour to hold a role anywhere, a similar role anywhere in the country. Um, her background includes time working in the charity sector, journalism and research, including heading up an international UNESCO supported charity promoting interfaith and global citizenship across the world. Over to you, Roxana. Roxana, we're not hearing you at the moment. Sorry, can you check your mic? All right, let me see. Does that work? No, oh, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Um, and I'll make sure my camera is on. Apologies for that, Kate. Um, I wanted to firstly say thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I was reflecting on some of the comments and contributions of David, and I think it, you know, he poses a, a, a bit, you know, challenging as well as really interesting, both conceptual and practical um, questions for local government. And as he was speaking, I was reflecting on the experience that I've had since I stepped into office back in May 2018. This balance between the central and the local, and how you empower local authorities uh, in in ordinary times, but also uh, given our experience of COVID-19, what um, has been particularly restrictive in terms of the centralized states. I also want to endorse everything that Rachel Reeves has said, particularly the constraining impact of the government's centralized approach. And what I intend to do as part of my contribution to this debate is touch on um, some of the characteristics of that crony state as we've experienced it here in Newham uh, as part of our response uh, that has been required uh, by all of local government, given the emergency context that we're operating in, uh, but also how it's been profoundly <laughs> at the local level. And as Rachel attests, the characteristics of the crony state have become uh, certainly extreme in many areas during the COVID-19 crisis under this Boris Johnson's uh, government, the emergency exemption and procurement laws that allow government to award contracts without having to uh, an open procurement process. And this includes a high priority channel for UK government contracts established where civil servants and ministers are able to recommend companies and the research and analysis shows that those companies are 10 times more likely to be successful. Uh, and one could argue that in an emergency context, when you're needing to source PPE, when you're needing to really boost up the infrastructure to respond to an emergency crisis that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, challenged us all with, uh, it is necessary, but it also highlights with real sharp focus the uh, undermining of that infrastructure, particularly in the context of public health, that has been systematic over the previous 10 years, driven by this ideology of austerity. And we know that around 18 billion pounds already have been used under these emergency uh, contract awarding facilities alongside the uh, controversial high profile appointments of uh, key leading figures from the private sector, Dido Hardin, the former chief executive of Talk Talk as head of the NHS Test and Trace uh, programme following the first pilot that uh, was universally condemned. And this cronyism has been endemic through the government's response to this crisis. But as David, um, you know, posits, the crony state is really another method of what, of what the Tory government 
has always been doing a part of its philosophy of a small state retrenchment of the state and enabling market forces. Uh, but in this context, it's particularly blatant and shameless because of the catastrophe that has befallen our communities and the catastrophic circumstances that we find ourselves in. You know, all of you will be uh, saddened, horrified with the growing number of cases, uh, the number of people that have died as a result of COVID-19 and the incompetence which uh, has led to the situation that we find ourselves in a country and the experience the third lockdown. And we know that our communities are paying the human cost and local councils uh, are a crucial line of defence. And over the past 10 months, uh, as I elaborate on what we've been doing, uh, as we manage and balance the centralised and the local, and, and how, uh, and as we uh, manage the constraining impacts of a government approach to this global pandemic, uh, I'll be able to highlight uh, some of the excruciating uh, circumstances that we're having to manage in terms of the human cost facing our people. Uh, what is very clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated uh, a crisis in public service and deep inequalities. And uh, as elsewhere, Labour-led councils such as Newham, such as Camden, have stepped in to deliver where the national government has failed. But this has been done in the context of local government spending power already uh, an excruciatingly small amount. You know, our spending power has fallen by some 20% over the last 11 years since 2010 and core funding to local government has fallen by 60%. And in the new context, pre-COVID-19, we already had to achieve £45 million of savings because of the unfairness of the spending review and local government funding allocations, which impacts communities such as those in, in Newham the most. And the pandemic to date has cost us some £60 million despite you know, the government emergency funding has just been 36.8 million. So we're gonna to have to account for that uh, funding shortfall. And in the context of the government at the first lockdown, you know, promising that the government will do uh, everything that it takes to support local authorities. Uh, it simply, simply put, uh, they haven't put their money where their mouth is. In the new context, in light of what I have said, the uh, costs uh, that we have been hit with uh, in terms of uh, a council, we essentially uh, are having to find uh, 25.3 million uh, uh, of money that we've lost uh, directly as a council, including 13.3 million pounds in lost income. And, you know, well, what we've been uh, attempting to do, to do in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and how we've been trying to reimagine uh, notions and concepts of the state in a pandemic a situation has been to leverage our um, ability with our local communities and working with our health partners to see how we can mitigate against the undermining of public health infrastructure. Uh, you should all know and be aware that the public health grant from local government to councils was 22% lower in real terms in 2020-21 compared to 2015 and 16. So we're starting from a really, really low baseline. And in the new Newham context, uh, that has hit us really hard. We already embarked uh, or faced the challenge of COVID-19, starting from a really, really low baseline in terms of health inequality, inequality generally and poverty. Uh, we have a situation where 97 people each year die because of polluting air. We have amongst the highest number of health in, uh, inequality indicators. And we have a community where 78% of our resident population is black and ethnic minority. And we know COVID-19 disproportionately hits the poor, disproportionately hits uh, ethnic minorities. And as a consequence, our COVID-19 
profile in terms of case rates and deaths has been very high. And similarly, uh, in addition to the human cost, uh, there's been an immense economic cost at a local and a human level. You know, the job um, losses here in Newham as a result of COVID-19 have been extreme. We're facing an economic catastrophe, catastrophe for our households. In February of last year, our claimant count was some 12,000 people. Over the subsequent two months, that increased to 24, and subsequently every single month, we have an additional 500 people joining the claimant count. And we anticipate that we will have an additional uh, between 45,000 to 60,000 people unemployed uh, as we progress with recovery whenever we can start recovery, given the context of the largest recession facing this country in the last 300 years. And what we have done in response to the impediments of a centralised approach, we've worked really heavily with our voluntary community faith sector, our local health partners. We've organised with our um, uh, voluntary sector under the auspices of the new food alliance whereby we have been allocating and distributing food parcels some 350 food parcels uh, comprising of healthy nutritious food which we've been able to pull together by using localized supply chains uh, is in stark contrast to some of the pictures that we've been seeing uh, in the news this week. And that's been delivered through a council owned local food company called Juniper, which we pre COVID-19 uh, and during COVID-19 when schools were open, uh, providing free uh, school meals to all primary schools. Uh, school children regardless of their background so we've repurposed that uh that that that, that vehicle that we uh manage and we had set up in any case to help us uh working with the voluntary sector to ensure that no family uh impacted by covid19 is left hungry and certainly uh no child uh, either so this new food alliance uh, as mentioned uh, 350 tonnes of food, equating to some 264,000 food parcels to over 16,000 new residents. And that's an example of the way in which we're able to work uh, in a balanced way as a council, a local authority, uh, having set up a company with our local um, uh, communities. And it's very much illustrative of Newham's response to the pandemic, which is rooted in what we uh, have uh, driven forward since 2018, which is our community wealth building ethos and agenda, which is about ensuring that we uh, work collaboratively with community, voluntary, faith and local business sector to demonstrate that local community uh, based inspired uh, solutions to the challenges facing us, uh, both in crisis times, but outside of crisis times, uh, are enabling us to, uh, you know, face a challenge, uh, not only of this disaster, but also help with the required recovery to come. Thanks very much, Roxana. I think uh, really um, interesting insight into the stark impact on the local government front line. Um, so we're going to turn to our final speaker before we have some questions. Um, Andrew Harrop, who's the General Secretary of the Fabian Society. Um, Andrew has been General Secretary since 2011. Um, and as well as steering the organisation so magnificently, um, he's led much of our research on economic and social policy. Over to you, Andy. Thanks. Kate has to say that, unfortunately, for her. <laughs> uh, thank you, anyway. Um, so I want to talk about Public Service Futures, which is the, uh, the book, the collection of uh, essays that we published. Well, we basically had written it when the pandemic started and published it back in March uh, as it was breaking. Um, and in the first sentence of the book, I wrote, welfare states across Europe are under strain and they will face further challenges in the years ahead. I couldn't have uh, known what further challenges just 2020 was going to uh, throw at the welfare states in the UK and across Europe uh, as I wrote those. But it's worth remembering 
uh, how frail the UK public sphere was before COVID hit us, after a decade of austerity and marketization and fragmentation. And let, let's think about some of the outcomes that uh, were being delivered by, uh, by that failure. Um, food banks and rough sleeping, things that we never saw uh, to any great extent, particularly food banks under a Labour government, um, far fewer older people getting care and support in their own homes uh, than 10 years previously. Uh, stalled life expectancy, you know, the, the most important indicator of all of uh, whether people are being served well by uh, their community, the society and the state. Uh, people had stopped living longer and living standards for people on lower incomes had not grown for almost 20 years uh, so that people on the lowest incomes were no better off than they had been at the turn of the century. That's all failure of the state. It's incredibly important, as other speakers have uh, reflected, that we reflect on the difference between what the public sphere is there for, uh, what public services are there for, and the role of markets. Uh, we should never be, as a party, anti-business or anti-competition, -comp but we should draw a very clear distinction between uh, what public services and the public realm is there for and what private enterprise is there for. And this government has so clearly failed to do that. One of the suggestions in the uh, Public Service Futures book is that we could do that by being much clearer about uh, the rights that are associated with public services, stronger social rights, as they're called, like the right to housing, to food, uh, to decent living standards, to good health, and use that as a framework in which we think about um, how our um, public services are delivered, what the aims of them are, and also to use it as sort of a back and forth dialogue between citizens and the state in terms of uh, richer fulfillment of that. And that would mean if we had that sort of approach, that even if there was some private delivery within the overall sort of public service realm, it would be in the context of delivering on, on rights, uh, making sure that uh, services are more generally affordable and universally available for all, delivered in the public interest, delivered collectively. The, um, the Public Service Futures book also talked about the new challenges that the public sector will face in the 10 years ahead. Um, the challenges of COVID obviously layered on top of that. Um, but even without COVID, we would need to be thinking about new challenges and a greater scope for uh, what public service delivery is there to do. The first biggest new challenge is, of course, uh, the fight against climate change. And we need to think of the role of the state very differently, including the role of public services, because of the challenge of decarbonising. So the state needs to have a bigger role, particularly in transport infrastructure um, and in uh, reducing carbon emissions in our homes uh, than it's ever we would ever have imagined. We are going to need armies of people uh, decarbonizing homes, taking it, replacing boilers, etc., house by house, street by street, a new public service. And similarly, we're going to have to have an approach to city transport that goes far beyond the traditional bus provision that you see in most municipal areas. Um, but we also need to think about our core public services. Uh, we are failing to deliver good enough or simply enough public services when it comes to uh, I've already talked about older people, care and support in old age, uh, but also the Fabians are currently working on a, a big commission on early years provision where we simply don't provide a good enough start for uh, very young children from disadvantaged backgrounds. We need better public provision. And then the third area we very much need a better public offer is on adult skills. Uh, the Fabians published the final report of the Commissions on Commission on Workers and Technology, uh, which concluded that we we almost need to start again on um, on adult skills and have you know basically a completely a complete step change in terms of the ambition, but also the public resource and the level of regulation on adult skills. Another new area for the state to go into. Now, of course, this all poses massive questions about public spending uh, because our ambitions are frankly larger than the likely resources we're going to have. And that's why the work that David and John Tizard are doing on good 
uh, accountability and trustworthy spending is so important. We need to prove as the left that every pound spent in the public realm is uh, going to be spent as well as possible, as effectively as possible. That doesn't mean for a, a race to the bottom in terms of uh, penny pinching and cutting, but it means really good quality spending. Um, one way that the Fabians have always described that is to be long termist in our spending. And you can really see this year, uh, I should say 2020, uh, the price of short termism. But it also means better coordination across government, um, the, an end to the fragmentation, which is actually probably the single worst thing about outsourcing is it stops public services working together because services start uh, just following contracts, just thinking in their little niche, rather than that broad sense of public duty and responsibility, the sorts of behaviours that Roxana described, working with the, her local public sector, with all the partners together. That's what goes when you have the fragmentation, the atomization of marketized public services. Um, so we need to tackle the fragmented marketized state now but we also need to do it thinking about the future of uh, a far more digital technologically powered public service um, which again we've started to see in 2020 as an emergency the way that public services responded um, so fast and so flexibly and um, innovatively to the challenges of delivering services remotely is just that this is just the start of the wave of change you're going to see for public services delivering uh, through technology far more than ever before, and that's going to require the sort of um, you know sort of cross public service uh, uh, you know cooperation and collaboration um, that uh, the conservative approach to uh, the public realm has just uh, destroyed and, and moved against. We need to have a system where local decision makers in whatever public agency, whether it's local government or national public service, work together, have frontline responsibility and autonomy to make decisions for themselves, to use technology well. Yes, with a core spine of um, national requirements and the outcomes that uh, David talked about and worried about in terms of what happens when there are local conservatives in power, but enough responsibility and flexibility so they can deliver um, the, the only in a digital age it will only work when you have um horizontal empowered public servants uh, making decisions for themselves not taking orders top down and i think that this can all be bound together if we think about how do we re uh, reinvent a public ethos and culture a public character for our public services of course there are so many fantastic uh public servants but often they are they're working against uh, the the culture that's coming down from government from the the marketization that we've seen you know sort of rewarded this year, and we need to sort of create a different sort of um, culture which is you know starting with uh, the the values of public service delivery and seeing that as the the sort of like the sort of the lodestar of everything that happens in the state rather than just the sort of the narrow atomized uh, efficiency driven approach that led to uh, the outsourcing scandals that we've been talking about. So I think uh, in conclusion, uh, public service futures means being positive about change, positive about uh, technology, having new ambitions, not just saying this is as far as public service delivery to go because the problems are growing and we need responses that are collective and coordinated and often delivered by the state. It means new approaches about fragmentation being overcome, good coordination and partnership and that public ethos, because the public realm is different from private marketized delivery. Great, great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and um, like another great challenge there, reinventing the public ethos. Um, I'd like to take some questions because we, uh, we've had some fantastic contributions, but we um squeezed a little bit on question on time for questions so i'm going to read them out and group them which i think will allow us to get through more um i've got one from richard um how can we use this pandemic to persuade the majority of people that local public services are not wasteful and inefficient and that private contracts 
waste our taxpayers' money. And then on a sort of similar, allied but different um, note, um, question from Chris Michael. Um, this is another opportunity to continue Labour's increasing status as the party of business. Can we use the voice of the huge number of companies overlooked because of cronyism to speak for Labour against the corruption under the Tories? Um, Rachel, can I start with you and, and take um, um, one other or, or a little bit of both that we can um, try and squeeze in as many answers as possible? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I think that um, they're both really good um, questions. Uh, thanks very much, um, Richard and, and Chris. Um, on, on Richard's question, it is quite interesting, actually, in the focus groups that we've been doing as a party, um, without any prompting, the issue of um, contracts comes up and people We've lost Rachel there. Um, we'll hopefully we'll get her back again. Um, Roxana, could you come in with with something on those questions? You need to your mic on, Roxana. No. Can, can you hear me now? Shall I continue? Yeah, uh, I just asked Roxana to speak, but her mic wasn't actually on. So, yes, Rachel, go ahead. Okay. No, we are having a few technical issues now, I think. Can't hear hey, you. can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Roxanne. Yeah, I think what's happening is there's someone who's managing the platform is muting all of us and then unmuting, so we can't actually unmute ourselves. But um, do you want to unmute Rachel and then I can come after Rachel? Or do you want me to respond I, to um, Fabian team, I'm not muting or unmuting anyone. Okay, something's um, happening. Right. If you can hear me, I'll just do a quick response to uh, the first question that was asked by um, one of the uh, members uh, on this uh, discussion panel around how do we highlight the um, amazing work that's been done um, at local level, uh, you know, as part of that reimagining um, or reinventing the public ethos that Andrew talks about and, and emphasising and amplifying the partnership work by means of demonstrating and illustrating the contrast to a Labour approach, uh, um, you know, over what the Conservative government and Boris Johnson uh, and his ilk are doing. And I think there is um, a huge amount that we can be doing through um, amplifying all the great examples I've seen as part of the chat, some of the examples um, that have been driven at uh, Oxford City Council despite um, you know, some of the constraints that they're finding themselves in. And these are things that have been highlighted by uh, the, you know, across the wider Labour family, the Friday Shump front bench. And I know that we, Rachel has um, invited people and local leaders to provide examples. And I think it's uh, also about highlighting the innovative ways in which we are undertaking a call to action as part of this reimagining the public space and the public ethos. And certainly here in Newham, we've commenced that under the auspices of our participatory democracy initiative through our um, absolute intent to look at all of the outsourced contracts that were undertaken by the council prior to me stepping into office and looking at ways in which we can adopt new models of collaboration and partnership work uh, in the form of co-ops or other forms of community interest companies, but also enabling and providing and equipping, uh, you know, the different ecologies that exist 
in a local neighborhood area with the aptitude and the proficiency and the skills and the competency to be able to uh, contract for tenders that we're issuing. So we've switched uh, our whole procurement framework uh, and uh, presently some 29% of all of our contracts go to local suppliers uh, and these are examples that we're manifesting and kind of promoting and showcasing as part of alternatives to what a renewed and revived public service um, you know, uh, landscape can look like in the 21st century. And Andrew makes the right point that digital is going to have a profound impact in the way in which this also manifests. And there's some really interesting work happening in local government on this endeavour as well. Great, thank you, Roxana. Um, Rachel, shall we tempt fate and see whether you can answer the the, the questions that, that yeah. the couple of things that uh, I'd, I'd read yeah. out earlier? Okay. I'll start talking. I'm talking now. If you can't hear me, just put it in the chat uh, and I'll try and sort that um, out. Um, I, I think that this issue that um, Labour can be the party of business and the party of workers is a really important one. So thanks for mentioning that, Chris, because I think we shouldn't see a contradiction between um, the, the, the two. What we're against is the cronyism that we're seeing during this crisis. And no one thinks there should be a, a central um, government department of, of making PPE. Um, but what we do want to see is those PPE contracts going to firms with a track record of being able to, um, to, to deliver. And you see it as well with um, Brexit, um, that there has been an, an absolute indifference from this government on the impact that, um, that, that Brexit and the deal, the thin deal that the government has signed is going to have. And, and businesses would, would have been blamed um, for the, 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 the lack of preparations, even though they didn't know until the 24th of December what they were supposed to be um, actually preparing for. And, uh, and, and so I think both on outsourcing and Brexit is a real opportunity for Labour to cement ourselves as being both the part of business and also the party of workers. Uh, we are cutting through on these issues of contracts. As I said, I, I hope you might have heard and tried to speak um, earlier. Um, these issues are coming up unprompted in focus groups and in discussions I'm having with constituents and, and at other um, public events. And that's really good. And as I said earlier, it's cutting through because it's not working. You know, no one would mind if the government was outsourcing contracts and it was going really well. If everybody who um, needed testing got testing, if everybody who um, uh, had come into contact with someone with the virus um, was being followed up with, if every PPE contract was delivering so that our frontline workers were properly protected. But it's not working. And that's why we have a real opportunity to highlight the waste and inefficiency, which look are weaknesses for Labour. We know that. Um, that Labour are seen as lending money, but not creating the wealth. This is an opportunity to show that Labour care. I think we got most of what Rachel was, was saying there before we lost her again. Um, Andy and David, if you don't mind, we, we're right up on time. I'm going to take a last couple of questions and just rather than bring you in now, you can choose which of any of the topics before we close, but if we can all keep it tight so that everyone can get a, a lunch break. Um, we have a question from Emma Burnell. Um, given its strong history of centralising power, how can Labour be trusted to devolve real power to local government and ensure they have the muscle to deliver the public services their areas need? Um, and another one I wanted to bring in was Anna Smith. I'd like to bring everything we do at our council back in house, but it can be more expensive as some contractors can offer economies of scale. Will a Labour government increase funding so that we can do the right thing? So um, I'll bring in David and Andrew and then um, Roxana and Rachel, if you've got anything to add, but we're going to keep it quite tight now. I was just saying, Rachel, as we're running over time. Um, thanks, David. Very, very briefly, just on that question of the alleged economies of scale that private contracting can bring, 
often we don't account properly. We forget that if a private company makes people redundant, if it reduces their pay, there is a social price to be paid and some other part of the state will have to pick up that cost. So a proper full social accounting of contracting could easily end up saying it is more expensive to take a contract with a private company which ostensibly looks cheaper than what an in-house offer would be. So um, I think we do need a, a lot more attention paid to the rather narrow calculations that some public bodies sometimes make about contracting and look at the phenomenon much more in the round. Great, thank you, David. Um, Andy, would you like to come in on any of those points? So I, I agree totally with what David just said. And I think we need to think about basically a, a different type of relationship with business in the delivery of public services, not no relationship. Um, so there are times when uh, the, when businesses can provide bits of public services much better than the state, but we mustn't ever let it be because they're treating their workforce um, worse or because they are cutting corners. It needs to be because of the genuine innovation that they can bring. And I talked about digital earlier. Of course, the private sector has a huge role to play as a partner to government in delivering good digital public services. No one wants uh, that to be exclusively the domain of, of the public sector. Um, but that, that's a really good example of how um, Business can be part of, if you like, you know, sort of the supply chain of public services rather than taking over whole swathes of the public sector, which has been tested to destruction over the last 10 years and, and, and longer and, and just has failed so many times. And it's also failed for those reasons I talked about, about fragmentation and ethos, uh, which is so important and will become increasingly more important as we go forward to challenges of the new challenges of the next 10 years. Where fragmentation, I think, is going to be sort of this this sort of killer problem uh, facing public services. Um, so, uh, not anti-business, but a new role for business in a much more coordinated uh, public sector, drawing on models from elsewhere in Europe, where there is lots of non-profit and private sector delivery, but it's within a stronger framework and stronger set of, if you like, a public service culture, so that you don't have these tensions that we've had with this marketization and atomization without the values you need to make sure that there's a strong public realm. Thank you. Um, Roxana and Rachel. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure if you've heard all of the questions, but we've just been talking about, um, firstly, whether a Labour government will increase funding so that councils can bring services back in house and also how Labour can be trusted to devolve real power to local government and ensure they have the right muscle they need to deliver. Um, Roxana, firstly, can I ask you whether you've got, you'd like to make a point? Before yeah, and what are the manifesto commitments um, I put forward when I um, stood for office was to a review of all of our outsourced uh companies or arms of the council uh because it had become really in endemic and levels and quality of service delivery had really exacerbated this uh you know exacerbated this distance between residents who are the community that we serve quality of delivery and actually value for money and we've gone through a 13 month almost three year process of completely kind of reshaping the framework through which we engage with supplies contractors, we've asserted a really, really clear overt framework that places an emphasis around social value, but also the outputs and the outcomes that we're looking to achieve for our residents. And I similarly agree with Andrew. I don't think it's a complete exclusion of the private sector because there are some areas of service delivery where actually it's not um uh the the appropriate space for for councils to be engaging in but it's kind of how you reshape that partnership working uh set within the confines of really really clearly you know stated uh objectives outcomes and social value for people and residents at a local level including value for money and we're doing a huge sort of range of different you know innovative approaches 
uh, working, you know, as I've said before, with the voluntary sector, but also with local businesses in order to open up opportunity to ensure efficacy, because ultimately for us, it's the outcomes that we are tr striving to achieve for our local residents where issues of inequality, poverty, housing crisis, you know, health inequality, climate emergency are really, really real. And over the coming months, working with the local Newham Fabian Society, we'll be having further conversations uh, and debates, but actually action about how we can bring all these things to life. Great, thank you, Roxana. Um, sorry, I haven't been able to get to all of the questions, but um, We'll finish up now. Rachel, I'll give the last word to you if there's anything you want to come back on on those questions that, that um, we've just been discussing. Yes. I'll, I'll just be, I'll just be um, very brief. Um, I think, first of all, there's a big difference between um, cost and value. That was a big theme of um, Mark Carney's um, wreath lectures um, this year, and I, and I think that oh dear, I think we've lost Rachel again. Um, sorry about that. I'm sure we would have, um, you know, wanted to hear what she closed with. But thanks to all of our speakers for wonderful contributions um, this afternoon and to everyone in the audience for their engagement and some really good questions. Um, I'll, I'll close up now because I think we've run into lunch break and the next session is at um, 2.15, I believe. Thanks very much. <laughs>